Hey everybody, this is John from the West Virginia Robotics Alliance, and this is the video recorded version of our workshop on CAD or VEX IQ. So in this video, we're going to talk about uh, kind of what CAD is and why your VEX IQ challenge team uh, might want to use it. We'll talk about some of the options that you have for CAD, uh, and we'll have a demo of my preferred option, which is LDCAD. Okay, so CAD uh, stands for Computer Aided Design. And what we're doing with CAD is creating uh, kind of 3D virtual models of our VEX-IQ robots or other structures. Uh, and there are various reasons that uh, you might want to do this as a VEX-IQ challenge team. I think there are kind of three big reasons uh, to use CAD. The first reason is you can, uh, you can build prototype mechanisms or design those mechanisms or even entire robots without needing access to physical parts. So whether you are uh, you know, working remotely or you're just not with your parts right now or you had an idea and you want to kind of mock it up real quick, uh, it can be really convenient to be able to design things without having parts in hand. Uh, second reason to use CAD is that it gives you a record of your designs and what they look like after you take them apart, right? So any robot you build with the VEX-IQ system uh, pretty much is going to get taken apart eventually, right? No one has infinite parts. And so if you build something, eventually those parts are going get, to get taken apart and, and put back in the bins. But if you model stuff in CAD prior to taking it apart, right, then you have a record of what your robot looked like, how it was built, and that can be really useful uh, for, for going back and looking at later, right? Maybe down the road you want to design a new mechanism that behaves in a similar way or that does the same thing to something you previously built. Uh, if you have a CAD model of that mechanism, it can be really easy to go back and say, okay, that's how that worked, and now I can apply that, that, that design I've already done to my new robot. So it can be really convenient to have a record of, of what you've built in the past. And the third reason to use CAD uh, is that it makes your documentation better, or it can make your documentation better. Um, by taking screenshots of, of CAD, um, you, know, you, you can do stuff that you can't do very easily with photographs or with drawings. Uh, if there's a part in the way of showing how your mechanism works, you can hide it. Um, if you want to you know, zoom way into a tiny little part, you can do that. Uh, more easily than taking a, a photo. Um, so CAD, uh, screenshots and other information can be a great addition uh, to your engineering notebook as well. So I, I want to kind of talk about uh, as sort of more, more illustration of what the power of CAD can be, um, a project that we worked on. Uh, so this was, a, this was a robot that we built uh, about a year ago now as kind of a prototype for a, a uh, challenge uh, competition. Um, it was uh, me and one other person working together on this robot. And we had probably three months or so to, to get this design done. But within the, those three months, we only had four or five days when we were actually together in the same place with the parts working on the robot. So we really needed to, to use CAD to kind of make the most of our time and do as much work as we could uh, r remotely. Um, so here's the, the, we built a prototype robot with physical parts and then modeled it in CAD. Once we had that CAD model, we were able to make revisions to the design, make the robot more compact, change how some of the sensors were mounted and so on. We were able to make those revisions in CAD without having the robot with us and pass the CAD files back and forth, you know, talk about what different revisions we wanted. Oh, I think we should uh, do this so we can make it a little more compact if we do this other thing. So we were able to do all that really quickly and conveniently in CAD without needing the physical parts. Then once we were happy with kind of the overall chassis, we were able to start designing and adding other features. So this was like a winch. The robot like lowered itself down through a hole on a string. So we designed this winch uh, and that went on the robot after we designed it in CAD to make sure everything would fit and all the parts would go together the way we wanted. We could design additional features. This was like an anti-tip mechanism that went on the back of the robot. So we could do all this design work really conveniently in CAD. And then for our, our, uh, our, our documentation of how this was built, 
We could uh, kind of use our CAD model to render photorealistic images, which ended up looking really cool and were a great kind of selling point of our, our approach. Uh, so we were able to get a lot of this design work done, uh, all virtually without being in the same place, without even having parts in front of us a lot of the time. Uh, so it made made this design process you know, go a lot smoother, and we did you know, more faster than, than we could have done without access to CAD. So CAD can be a really useful tool to have kind of in your, in your toolbox as a, as a VEX IQ challenge team. So there are kind of two approaches uh, that, that we can take to using CAD with the VEX IQ platform in particular. Uh, the first approach is we can use kind of these industry standard CAD packages like SolidWorks or Inventor or Onshape or Fusion 360. Uh, there are parts available in the step format um, on the VEX website. We can download those parts and open them in any of these uh, kind of standard software packages and build assemblies like that. Uh, that approach certainly has its advantages. There are a lot of teams uh, that like to do that, and it can work very well. Um, however, what I'm going to focus on uh, for, for this video is approach number two, which is to use an LDRAW format. Uh, LDRAW is a file format that's designed specifically for doing this sort of CAD work with these plastic construction systems, and I think it offers uh, a, a number of advantages. Um, I think compared to those kind of industry standard packages, the barrier to entry uh, with LDRAW can be a lot lower. The learning curve, uh, I think, is not as steep, so it can be a lot easier to get started uh, more quickly. Um, LDRAW is an established standard that has a lot of support. There are a lot of different applications that understand this file format, and that means that there are various different LDRAW editors that have different features, so you can try a bunch of different programs and kind of settle on the one that you like, which I think is really nice. So a little bit about Eldra. Um, Eldra was, was originally developed actually in the mid-1990s, and it was designed for um, modeling Lego assemblies in CAD. Um, so designed originally for Lego. It is not a single app. Um, it's not like Onshape or Fusion 360. What it is is a file format. So it's like the PDF file format or the doc file format. We have the Eldra file format. And using this LDRAW file format, we can uh, kind of model either a single part, like a 2x2 two two brick or a 2x4 brick or whatever single part, and we can, we can model whole assemblies of parts, so like a whole pyramid built out of a bunch of 2x2 two two bricks we can have in that standard uh, file format. There are many different programs available that can create and edit uh, LDRAW models. So again, it's not just one program, it's a file format that a bunch of programs can understand. And alongside that file format, there is what's called the LDRAW parts library. And that is a standard set of files for basically every individual part. So we have in the library a file that is just a 2x2 two two brick, and a file that is just a 2x4 brick, and a file that is just a minifigure head. Or, and we have all these files, and then using our editor, we can create different assemblies of this file of, of these parts, these files, and save that in the LDRAW file format too. So the LDRAW file format, again, was designed for LEGO, but it can be used to model VEXIQ assemblies as well. All we need is a parts library. Instead of having a parts library of LEGO parts, if we have a parts library of VEXIQ parts, then we can use all these same editors to model, to CAD model our VEXIQ assemblies too. Um, so this parts library is is available. It, it, it exists, and if you've uh, if you've kind of looked into doing VexIQ CAD, um, you've probably heard of or maybe played around a bit with SnapCAD. Uh, SnapCAD is the kind of officially endorsed solution. It's published by Vex, and what it is is an existing LDRAW editor, uh, an LDRAW editor called MLCAD with a copy of this VEXIQ parts library, so that instead of modeling LEGO structures, you can uh, model VEXIQ structures. So that's one option is SnapCAD, um, but there are lots of different LDRAW editors. 
and you can use other LDRAW editors uh, with this VexIQ parts library. So uh, another option is LDCAD for VexIQ. LDCAD for VexIQ is basically the same, same idea as SnapCAD, but instead of being based on MLCAD, it's based on LDCAD. Uh, and again, it, you can use it with that IQ parts library. And it's got a couple of tweaks to make it work a little bit better uh, with IQ parts uh, in particular. So there's kind of a separate version that's a little bit optimized for Rex IQ. So those are kind of the, the two um, big names. But again, there are lots of other LDRA editors, uh, LeoCAD and Rick Smith and others I'm, I'm forgetting here. And you can use any of these uh, LDRA editors with the IQ parts library to, to model your own structures. So there are lots of different editors. Uh, my personal preference is for LDCAD. I think it has some really uh, useful features, such as automatic pin snapping, which we'll take a look at uh, in, our, in our demo in a bit. Uh, it has a really nice 3D image rendering. Um, it makes it comparatively easy to model flexible parts like cables and rubber bands and chain. So my preference personally is for LDCAD. Um, other people might prefer SnapCAD or another LDRAW editor, and that's okay. I think the real advantage of this LDRAW format, or one of the big advantages, um, is that there are many different editors that can understand this format, right? So although we're going to look at SnapCAD for our demo, I'm sorry, not SnapCAD, we're going to look at LDCAD for our demo, um, I think what's really nice is you can play around with all these different editors, you can create your model in LDCAD and then edit it in SnapCAD, or you can create a model in another editor and bring it back to, to uh, wh whichever one. So you don't have to choose just one of these. You can play around with different ones, find one that, that you like, uh, and, and kind of each person can, can use whatever LDRAW editor um, they prefer. Okay, so we're gonna have a, a, a short uh, demo of LDCAD. We're gonna build a couple of uh, simple robots. Let me move over to that window here. Okay, so I've got uh, two kind of simple little models that we're gonna build. We're gonna start by building the VexIQ SAMI just to get familiar with kind of the, the LDRA interface and how it works. And then we'll move on to building something just a little bit more complicated. So uh, this is the LDCAD interface. This is what it looks like when you first uh, open it up. Uh, and the first thing I'm going to do is start a new model. And it's going to ask me to type in the name of that model, and I'm going to call it Sammy, because that's what we're going to build first. So now I'm uh, in a new blank file. So the first thing to be familiar with is the parts picker over here in the left. So in this area, I can look through all the available parts. I can uh, search through them in various ways and drag them into my model. Uh, notice as I hover over different areas and buttons here, I get this text in the bottom left of the window here changes to tell me what I'm hovering over right now. And that happens throughout the whole interface. Every time I hover over something, I'll get an explanation of what I'm hovering over down in this bottom left area. So this first option gives me all the different parts in the library kind of sorted by what they do. So like this first category is axles and spacers. If I go up, here's beams and plates. Here's all the corner connectors, electronics, gears, and so on and so on. Um, so that's one really useful way to get uh, to the part I want. Um, in this option here, I have uh, a, a number of kits. And if I pick like this one is the super kit, and here I get uh, only the parts that are in the VexIQ super kit. And these numbers here are the, the, the number uh, of each of these parts that come in that kit. So that can be useful if you're building something specifically from the super kit. And then if I click this third option, this is the search area. So if I um, select that option, I'm now going to hover my mouse over here and start typing. So let's say I want, for example, a pin. If I type pin in there, 
then I'm going to get in this window all the different pins that are in the parts library. And in fact, I can search like that uh, anywhere in my parts picker. So let's say I'm in beams and I want to get uh, all the two by whatever beams. I'll hover my mouse over there and type in 2x, and now I get all the beams that are two holes wide. So it can be really convenient to search uh, through here. Okay, so that's the parts picker. Uh, we also have up above the parts picker, the color picker. You can see as I scroll through, I have this wheel and I'm moving my scroll wheel on my mouse right now, and that's causing the wheel to rotate and I can pick all the different colors. And if I click on a color, let's say I want blue, notice that when I clicked on that blue color, all the parts in my parts picker turned blue. So that's how I choose what color I want my parts to be. Um, this area down here is the last few colors I've used. So if, if I'm only using a few colors in my model, rather than scrolling around the wheel here, I can just switch between the last couple of colors. Uh, notice also that we have these tabs here, right? So in my uh, parts picker, I have this tab 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And each of these tabs is its own parts picker. So I can navigate different parts pickers to different places and switch between them quickly. For example, I might want uh, tab 1 here to be axles. I might want tab 2 to be pins, 3 to be connectors. I could have tab 4 be beams and so on. And that way I can switch between kind of the most common categories of parts a little bit more quickly than uh, navigating through these menus. And in the color picker, I also have these tabs. Um, so I can go up here and choose between the different categories of colors. I think this isn't quite as, as useful in the color picker just because most of the colors I'm gonna be using are in this first category, solid plastic. But there's also, you know, I might have uh, some transparent parts or some metal parts or some rubber parts or, or whatever. Um, so if I want to, I can leave my second parts picker on like metal and my third on, on rubber and so on. But more often than not, we're going to be sticking to just these solid plastic uh, colors. Okay, so I've got my parts picker. Let's uh, drag our first part into our model. The first part in our instructions here is this one by six uh, beam. Uh, the typical color for one by six beams is dark gray. I'm here in my beams and plates category. And here it is here. So I'm going to click and drag this beam into my area. And I'm still holding down my left mouse button. I'm still clicking and dragging. While I'm doing that, I can use the arrow keys to rotate the part around in various ways. I want this beam to kind of be upright so it matches our instructions here. So I've used the arrow keys to get the part oriented how I want. Now I'm going to let go, and now it's in our model. Uh, I've selected the part. I can use the escape key to unselect it. Um, once I've got the part in my model, I can move around the model. So we can uh, orbit. We can orbit by clicking and holding the right mouse button and moving the mouse. So I'm right clicking and dragging to orbit around the part in various ways. Now, when you first uh, open up LDCAD for the first time, uh, there's a setting that I think is worth changing. So if I hover down here in the bottom left corner, I get this little area where I can change different settings. The one I want to change is this one here. As I hover over it, it says rotation mode toggle. There are two rotation modes. The default is this one TBL, and I think the TBL rotation mode is really difficult to use. So what you should do, or what, what I always do and what I would recommend, is to change that rotation mode by, from TBL to SPN just by clicking on it. And in the SPN mode, I think SPN is short for spin, and TBL is trackball. But in this, uh, in this spin mode, I think the, the way we orbit around the part makes a lot more sense. So I can right click and drag to orbit around. If I hold down the shift key while I right click and drag, then I can pan around. So I'm holding down shift, right clicking and dragging, and then I can pan around. So between these two, I can kind of navigate around and see whatever 
uh, whatever angle of the assembly I want to see. Then the last kind of important way to move around the part is to zoom in, and we can zoom in by using the scroll wheel. So as I scroll kind of up here, I'm zooming in. As I scroll down, I'm zooming out. So that's how we can navigate around our part. Okay, uh, continuing step one here, we need a couple of these um, one by two pins in these two holes here. So let's grab them. I think I left, yeah, this one on pins and standoffs. Those are blue. Here's the one by two pin here. And I'll click and drag that into my part. I'm gonna use my arrow keys to rotate that around the way I want, which is this orientation. And notice that as I bring the pin kind of close to the holes, it will automatically snap into place there. Uh, this is automatic pin snapping. As you bring pins close to holes, they automatically snap in place. And it is an extremely convenient and useful feature that not all LDRAW editors have. Um, so this is, I think, uh, one of the features, one of the big features that makes me really like LDCAD over some of the other options available is this automatic pin snapping. So there's my first pin in place, and then the second one goes uh, three holes up. Now I could um, drag another pin in here from my uh, parts picker, but I could also copy and paste the one I've already got, uh, and that's often a little faster. So I'll click it to select it, and then I'm going to press Control-C to copy and Control-V to paste, and now I get a second one of these parts. I can move it around, auto snap it into place, and when I click with the left mouse button, it will be placed uh, in, in that location. So that's the location of the second pin. Um, if I had accidentally misplaced one of these, I can just click and drag the part to move it. And again, it will automatically snap in place. So if maybe I had accidentally put the pin in this hole instead of this one, I can just click and drag to put it where I want it. Okay, and then the third, uh, the last part in this first step is this uh, idler pin here, which I think is white. And it is this part here. I need to rotate that around so it's facing that other way and snap that right in there. Okay, so that's step one of our build instructions done. Uh, in step two, let's see, we're attaching the legs here. Those are a couple of 30 degree beams. So where were beams? There are the beams, go back to dark gray, and I could scroll all the way down through here to search for my 30 degree beam, or I could just search for 30, and that will get me all the beams with 30 in their name, and here's our 30 degree beam. I'll rotate that around with my arrow keys, snap that into place, pan around so we can see the whole model, and then we want another one on the back side. So I'll control C to copy, control V to paste, and place that there. So now we've got our parts in place, but we're not quite done with this step. There's kind of a problem, or not necessarily a problem, but there's, there's a difference between what the instructions show and what we have in our model, which is that uh, this back leg is at a different angle than the front leg, right? So we want to rotate we want to rotate this leg here so that it's uh, poking up a little higher. So this is an opportunity where, or th this is a, a, a place rather, a time when we want to use this uh, more advanced editing control. So as we click on a part to select it, this appears. This is called the editing pin. And this is a way for us to move and rotate parts uh, more precisely than just dragging them around and using the arrow keys. So there are kind of three modes. Uh, notice I can click and drag this top triangular part here to move the editing pin in and out. Um, sometimes if it's like too close, it can be stuck in another part of the model, and so you want to move it further away. And then by clicking these different areas on the editing pin, I can change what I'm editing. So there are kind of three modes. Uh, this one in the middle will move the part. Uh, so I can move the part here, and this is a little more precise than just dragging it around. Notice I'm not snapping to the holes here. So sometimes I want to move the part in a way that it's not snapped to the holes, and I can do that here in these two axes. As I orbit around the part, 
you can see that the editing pin uh, moves around in different places. And what that's changing is what directions I can move the part in. So if I'm looking at it at this beam from this side, I can move the part in this direction and in this direction, but I can't move it in this other direction kind of in and out of the screen. If I want to do that, then I rotate around so that I'm looking at it from this side, and now I can move the part in that dimension. So what directions we can move parts in depends on what, uh, what angle we're looking at them from. Uh, this outer control here will rotate the part. And again, depending on what direction I'm looking at them from, that changes kind of what axis we're rotating it around. I can click and drag here to rotate the part different amounts. So I can rotate my part, but we're, this isn't quite what we want to do, right? Because we're rotating the part around its center here. And what we really want to do to get the, the leg at a different angle is rotate the part around this pin. So that's what the third mode is for. That's this inner button here on our editing pin. Now the third mode, we have these uh, arrows to move uh, something here, but in this mode we're not moving the part, we're actually moving the center of rotation of the part. So you can see as I move here, the part stays the same, but this line changes, and that shows us where the center of rotation is. So I'm going to move that so it's up in the middle of this hole here, and now we can go back to our rotation mode and move it around. And now as we rotate our beam, it's rotating about this uh, hole where we moved the center of rotation to. Now this works okay, but it's kind of a cumbersome process to move the center of rotation to exactly where we want to go. So in this case, there's kind of a trick we can use to make that go faster. And that trick is to select multiple parts. We can select multiple parts by uh, holding down the control key. So I'm going to select first this pin, and then I'm going to hold down the control key and click on the beam. And now I've selected both parts. And when we select multiple parts, the rotation center is whatever part we selected first. So because I selected the pin first and then the beam, now when we rotate, it's just going to rotate around that pin automatically. If I had done that in the other order, if I had selected the beam first and then the pin, now we're rotating both parts around the middle of the beam, which is not what we want to do. So select the pin first and then the beam, and then we can rotate both parts here. Now this is slightly different to what we were doing before. The way it's slightly different is that we're rotating both the pin and the beam, right? When we move the selection center, we were just rotating the beam. When by using this trick, we're rotating both parts. Now in this case that's okay because the pin is a cylinder basically and it doesn't really matter how the pin is rotated. There may be some other cases if we're doing something more complicated where you know we, we don't want to rotate the pin or we don't want to rotate some other part but usually there is a kind of some way that you can select them some part that you can pick to be the center of rotation that will make things work out the way you want. So that's a really, uh, really convenient and useful trick for rotating parts more quickly. Okay, next step in our build instructions. Now we're attaching the arms to Sammy, and those are 60 degree beams. So I'll change my color back to dark gray, backspace, backspace, and type in 60, and there's our 60 degree beam. Rotate that around the way we want. Attach our first one here. Control C to copy, Control V to paste, attach number two there. And then again, we want to rotate uh, one of them, uh, this one here, so that it's up a little higher. So I'll select first the pin, then hold down Control and click the beam. Now we have them both, and we can rotate that up like that. So there's step three done. And then last step is to attach this uh, pulley which is Sammy's head. So that'll be I'm not sure off the top of my head where the pulley is. So let's use the all search function. I'll type in pulley. And I only had to get to PU before I could see all the parts I wanted. 
And it looks like we need uh, that one with four holes there, which is the 30 millimeter pulley. And that'll just snap right onto our uh, pin there. So there we go, there's our SAMI assembled. Uh, we've learned about dragging parts in, moving them around, um, and so on. So the last thing I'll do is I'll save this model. Uh, we'll call it SAMI. I think I've already got a SAMI, so we'll call it SAMI2. And uh, there we go. So now let's move on to building a slightly more complicated uh, robot here. So this is uh, just a little mini VEX IQ robot that I like to use for uh, for little workshops and d demos and things. Uh, the original design for this robot is by Damien Key. He's at DamienKey.com. Uh, and I just made some, some modifications to make it a little bit more robust and uh, put together these, these build instructions. So I'll go back up to uh, File and start a new model, and I'll call this uh, Minibot. OK, now we're in a new model here. Now, the first thing we're going to build for this robot is uh, this little drive module with like a motor and a, a wheel on it. And we actually need, we can see in the instructions, we can see in the instructions here, we need two of these modules. So we could, um, in our CAD software here, we could just assemble it twice. Um, you know, this model doesn't have too many parts. It wouldn't take us very long to assemble it uh, twice. But I think a, a more um, kind of robust idea or a, a better way to do things um, is to actually have a sub-model that is this drive module. So what we're going to do is create kind of a sub-model within our model that will be this drive module. And then when we're actually assembling our robot, this whole drive assembly that we'll put together will behave as one single part. So I'm going to go up to Model and choose Add New Sub-Model. I'm going to call my sub-model Drive module and hit OK. And now we can start to build our drive module. So what do we need? Uh, the first thing we need is a motor. Which is down here somewhere. Smart motor, there we go. Use my arrow keys to get that in the same orientation as, excuse me, as our uh, image here, which is this one. Then what's the next thing we need? Next thing we need is four pins. Four one by one pins. Those are going here, 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 and here. And I, I again, this is one of those cases where I think it is just faster to copy and paste the parts rather than dragging each of them over individually. And then we need an axle. The axles are black, and this is a uh, this is a two p motor axle. That's this one here. Uh, rotate that around so that our motor and the little shorter end is at the bottom, and that'll just snap into this motor hole. So the automatic snapping doesn't just work for pins; it also works for shafts and some other things. So it's really convenient. All right. Step two is we need a two by eight. Uh, beam and one of those spacers. So we'll grab beams and plates. Those are dark gray. I'll just type in two by eight, rotate it around. That to go in that position there. Yeah, looks good. And then back to axles and spacers in black. And we want to grab our spacer here and just stick that on the shaft. And notice this also kind of snaps to the shaft as well. But oh, whoops, put that a little bit far too far down. So let's just go to our move mode and move that up a click. Um, by the way, I'm, I'm changing the color for each part just to kind of make it consistent with the what colors parts typically are. 
Um, if I get a part color wrong, like if I accidentally drag this spacer in while I was still on blue or whatever, um, I can change the color of parts uh, while they're in the model. So to do that, I'll just click the part to select it, and then I'll click my new color here and then click this large square, and that'll turn my spacer back to, to the correct color. Okay, now step three is we need a wheel and tire and a shaft collar. Let's go in here. Wheels and tires. The wheel, I think, is light gray. And there is actually a part in the parts library that has the wheel and tire together already assembled. There are also separate parts for the wheel and the tire. So we could drag a wheel, put it on, drag in a tire, put it on. Uh, but we can also just grab the wheel and tire as one unit. And I'll slide that onto my shaft. Uh, this is a good example of when the editing pin kind of clips into the part. I'm going to move it a little bit further out. And I'll just uh, move it down here. There we go. And then we need a shaft collar on top of there. That's in axles and spacers. And drop that on there. Okay, so we've got our drive module built. And so this is our kind of subfile is is made. And now I want to go back to our main model. And I can do that up here. So if I click on, uh, this is kind of the name of the model we're currently editing. We haven't saved our new project yet, so it's called new file. And within that new file, we're editing the drive module submodel. If I click that, I get a list of all the models that we're currently editing. So our SAMI file is still open. We didn't close our SAMI model that we already made. So that's in this list. We've also got our new file, which has two models in it, the main model and this drive module submodel that we created. So I'm going to go back to the main model here. And now this main model is blank because although we've uh, created our submodel, we haven't actually used that submodel in our main model. So we can do that back at the top level here. I want to go into this window, which is model overview and groups. Then this first option is all the models currently being edited. I could also pick this one, which is all the models in our current file. And here I can see the sub model that we created and I can drag that in. Now notice that at this point, this sub model behaves like a single part, right? It's not a bunch of parts, it is a single part that we can edit in our main model. So if I wanted to make a change to this submodel, I can go back in here and then edit that, and now I can see all the individual parts. But within our main model, this is a single part that we're using, just like any other part that we can get from the parts library. OK, next step in our build, we need two of these um, two of these drive modules oriented like that one here, then a second one oriented like this, kind of back to back here. Yeah, that looks right. And then we need four of these large corner connector pieces. There's connectors, that is, where is that piece? It's this one here. And the orientation here is a little tricky. That's how I want this one. Copy, paste, turn that around. Sometimes it can be a little tricky to use the arrow keys. There we go, that's how I want this one. Then in the back here, this one like that. And this one like that. Okay, so there's that step done. Next step in our build instructions, we need couple of two by eight beams and some pins. Those beams will go back to dark gray. These two by eight beams are gonna connect 
uh, our two drive modules together. And then we want uh, some one by one pins poking up in these four holes. And again, when you're placing a lot of these parts like this, I really find it faster to copy and paste rather than getting them back from the parts picker a second time. Okay, back to our instructions. Uh, now we've got kind of our chassis built, and the next thing we're going to do is mount the brain. Now, this brain, although we only need kind of one of these assemblies, I think it makes sense uh, kind of logically to treat this as a, as a sub-model too. Because this is kind of one unit in our, in our build. It's the brain plus all these other parts. So I think it's going to make it a little easier to assemble the model if we treat this as a sub-model. So I'll go back here again to model, add new sub-model. We'll call this one brain.ldr. And here we can build our brain sub-model just in the same way we did the drive module. So we need a brain. Control system here somewhere, dark gray. Uh, there are, you can see in the parts list here, there are a couple of different models for the brain. Um, one, some of them have the battery, some of them don't have the battery. Some of them have different radio modules. Uh, so I'm going to make sure I choose one of the ones with the battery, because we want the battery to appear in our model. Drag that in here. Uh, now, what do I need? I need a couple of pins. It's over here. We're going to go in these two holes. And then a corner connector in there. Uh, specifically this one snaps in there and then on that corner connector a one by eight beam and hover over that and just use the search to get to it quicker rotate that around and we want that to go there okay next step uh, rotate around attach the same thing on the other side so again, rather than searching for these parts in the parts picker again, I'm just going to copy and paste them from our other side. Okay, that looks good. I think that matches what's in our instructions. And now we can go back to the main file. And now this just mounts on top of our chassis to these four pinholes, to these four pins that we previously installed. So in our parts picker, I'll go back to uh, this menu. And now our brain appears again as a subfile. Get it around to the way we want it. Yeah, oh, there we go, that way. And snap that right on. And again, because this is a subfile, this whole assembly is treated as a single part in our main model. Okay, now we're going to build some kind of skids for the back of the robot. We're starting on this uh... oh, I've made a mistake here. I've made a mistake. I've mounted this brain backwards. So let's go back to our instructions here and we want the uh, you can see in our in our instructions we have kind of the overhanging part of the brain is over the back rather than the front with the wheels. So I just need to drop this around, arrow key to rotate around, and there we go. Okay. Uh, now we're going to start uh, building the skid on the left side here, and we need some pins and one of those smaller L's. And again, I could grab the pin from my parts picker, but I also have one right here that I can just quickly copy and paste. So that'll get it to me probably a little quicker. Drop those two in these two holes. Sometimes um, it's a you know you kind of have to move the camera around to help out the automatic pin snapping. It's easier if you zoom in a little bit or pan so that the hole you want is a little larger on your screen. And now we want a 
if I search for 90, yeah, I'll, I'll get this because it's a 90 degree beam. I'm gonna stick that on the, not quite there, right there. And then two more pins right there. So we'll copy paste, pins on. And then next up, we want one of these double 45 degree beams, a corner connector and some additional pins. So, here's that part we want. It's going to go on like this. Then we have our corner connector. This is the one we're looking for. That orientation, and then two more pins. here and here and that's that side built next step we're going to build the same uh, thing on the other side just as a mirror image so i'll grab my pins here grab my beam Two more pins, get this bent beam. So you can see as we're assembling this, just how quickly, and once you get into the flow of things and get your model started, you really can build up these structures pretty quickly. I think we built, you know, these two skids in CAD quite a bit faster than we could have with physical parts just because they were already right here we didn't have to search around through our pins for them and so on so once you get the hang of this you really can put stuff together faster in CAD than you can in real life okay, next up in our instructions we need another 2 by 8 beam to uh, connect those two skids together so beams and plates we're looking for dark gray just type in two by eight. Rotate that around. Oh, I'm wrong. I miscounted that. It's a two by ten B. Um, what I did there to delete is just hit the delete key. So select a part and then hit the delete key and it goes away. Okay, so now we've got our skins built. Now the next step in these instructions is to connect the drive motors to the brain with some cables. Uh, now, as we mentioned in our slides earlier, um, LTCAD does let you do this. There are um, cables in the uh, parts library and LDCAD, I think compared to other CAD, uh, other LDRAW editors, makes it pretty easy to uh, define the, the route that those flexibles flexible cables and other flexible components take. Um, in fact, that is how I did um, the cables in, in these instructions. These are modeled in LDCAD and it wasn't terribly difficult. However, um, I'm not gonna cover that in this video because it, it is a little complicated. There's some additional steps. Um, you know, realistically speaking, this is one of those times where you can maybe think, do I really need to model my cables in CAD? Um, you know, you might want to, you might want to check that there's enough room for the cable to route or something like that. But if you just want to show, you know, how all the parts go together, um, you know, it might be the case that modeling the cables isn't really worth the trouble. So for our purposes here, we're not going to model the cables, but you totally can do it. Um, you can read up about flexible components in the LDCAD uh, documentation, which we'll, we'll show here in a bit. So we're just going to move on in our building instructions to the next step which is to build this kind of claw gripper on the front of the robot. And again, I'm going to build this as a submodel, uh, not because we need more than one of them, but just because I think it's going to make, uh, make the assembly of our final robot a little bit easier. So back up here to model, add new submodel. This will be the gripper. Now we're in that submodel file. And the first thing we need is a motor. Or 
for it to be oriented like this to match our instructions. And then we need uh, some pins, and I think that's a three pitch motor axle. So we have pins here, here, and here. And then axles. Uh, this is the, yeah, this one here, the 3P motor axle. Flip that upside down so that the short end is on the bottom. It should, yeah, click right into our motor here. Right, then in the, the next step, we have a 4x4 four four plate and a couple of standoffs. So we've got two beams and plates. Oh. Hit the wrong button there. Okay, four by four is what I want to search for. And we want the axle, yeah, right like that. So the automatic pin snapping has been behaving really well for me so far in this video. Uh, there are definitely times when maybe you can't quite get the part where you want it to be. And so sometimes you just sort of have to get it close and then go back in with your editing pin here and move it over. But uh, the automatic pin snapping, let's see, that's where I want that. The automatic pin snapping generally does a really good job and is extremely uh, convenient. I do actually want to move it uh, just a click lower there. Yeah, there we go. Okay, and then we need two of those standoffs. That's uh, the shortest, yeah, half pitch. Those go in the outer two holes like that. Next step, we need a two gears and a three pitch cap shaft. The gears are in this category. It is this size gear? Just stick one of them on here. And the other one is going to go in this hole. We'll put the shaft in there first. It's the three pitch with end stop. We want the cap to be on the bottom here so it doesn't fall down. And then we'll copy and paste our our gears here. Now notice the automatic snapping has put these not quite at the same height. And if I use my editing pin, the difference in height is actually less than kind of one click here, one, uh, one square on this grid we can see. So if we want to get these at the same height, and it looks like this one needs to come down a little bit, we can actually make this grid a little smaller. And the way to do that is with the keys one through four. So by default, it's at eight uh, units here. And if I change that, I can change it, uh, if, I, if I click that rather, so let's go back here, we're clicking eight. If I click here, I can change that to fine, small, normal, or large. Normal is the default. Uh, but I think it's more convenient to just use the keys one, two, three, and four. And notice if I have a part selected, as I hit like one, two, three, and four, I can see how that changes my grid size. So again, three is our default. I think for this, I want to go down to two. And I don't know, actually, I want to go down to one even and move it down just a touch there. And then I'll go back to three to get my default size. Um, one more thing I'm going to do, and this is, you know, another one of those things that maybe we don't necessarily need to do in CAD, but we can is rotate one of these gears so that the two are actually meshing. So to do that, I'm going to select both the shaft and the gear, because the shaft will rotate with the gear. Go into our rotate mode here. And if we rotate it by this step size, which is 15 degrees, we do get that mesh, but it actually is moving by more than one tooth now. So just like we can change the step size for moving, we can also change the step the step size for uh, rotating. 
And the amount we actually want to rotate this is 5 degrees. It happens to work out that with this um, size gear, each tooth is 10 degrees apart. This is a 36 tooth gear, 360 degrees in a circle, so each tooth is 10 degrees apart. But you can see here we only need to move it half a tooth or 5 degrees. So I can change the rotation stepping to 5 degrees here, move the gear just by 5 degrees. Now they mesh nicely. And then I can go back to the default of 15 degrees. Uh, I can change these with control and 1 through 4. So again, control 3 for 15 degrees is the default. And we need to go down to 5 degrees, which is control 2. And you can see as I change those, uh, the kind of size of these wedges in this circle is also changing accordingly. Now we've got our, uh, our gears nice and meshed here. Okay, next step in our instructions is we need a couple of, these look like 1 by 8 beams, and some more pins. So we're going to attach these two beams to these gears. These are like the arms of our, or the fingers of our claw, I guess. We have four beams here. There are four pins there. Go up to the beams. Grab our one by eight beam. And snap that on. This side first. And then this side. Now this is a case where because we rotated this beam five this gear five degrees, uh, the pin snapping doesn't quite want to work out automatically. So you can see it snapped to this pin but then moved, uh, it's, it's clipping through this one. So we need to rotate this beam by five degrees. And again, we can use our trick of selecting the pin first and then selecting the beam to rotate it about this hole, just like we did with the arms and legs on Sammy. And then I'll hit control two to go down to five degree stepping and move it just that five degrees. Okay, now we need, let's see. Need pins also in these holes. Okay, next up we want to uh, have some of these beams. I think these are the 30 degree beams as kind of extensions for our gripper. So we'll go back here, get our 30 degree beam. that and again we'll need to rotate this around. Now in this particular case it happened to snap to this middle hole which is already where this beam rotates about. So that makes it a little easy to just a uh, little easier to just rotate at the amount we want. We'll stick the same one here and rotate that into position. Yeah that looks good. You can see these little edges line up. And then we need uh, these standoffs and two more of these beams down below. And that is the two pitch standoff, I think. Down on the bottom here. And now we can attach the, oh, that one didn't quite snap to the right place. Let's move that down. All right, that looks good. All right, now we can uh, copy and paste our beams here, get them on. Okay, so there's that step done. Next step, we'll turn around back here. I need two more standoffs uh, on top of here. That is the one pitch standoff. Let's grab these. And I grabbed the wrong color standoff by mistake, but that's okay. I'll just click black, change that color, copy paste to get a second one. Uh, next thing, we need another one of these uh, plates on top. That just sits right. Right there. 
And then a couple of shaft collars on these axles just to keep them in place. Okay, looks good. Next step. Put a 1x4 beam on top of here. Just grab a pin rather than going to find that again in the parts tree. And for the beams, we'll have to get a 1x4. Rotate it around, stick that in place. All right, we're almost done here. Next step, need another corner connector. This one. Whoops, didn't show that on screen. And then a couple of pins here and here. And then last thing in this assembly is a distance sensor it attaches right there. We'll go back to control system. Here's our Here's our next step, just popping a distance sensor on there. Control system, dark gray. Here's the distance sensor, and we want that to be the port facing upwards so that there is a place to attach it. Okay, so you can kind of see, you know, even though we're assembling something fairly complicated and intricate, you know, we, we can still put it together fairly quickly uh, just by using our, our tools here. So we, even something relatively complicated compared to the the chassis like that I think isn't uh, isn't too bad to put together. And of course, the more practice you have, uh, the quicker it'll go. Okay, so we're done with our um, done with our sub model here. We'll go back to the main LDR, and the next step is just to attach that to the front of our robot here. I think I had that in this tab. Yep, here's our assembly. Again, that just gets treated as a whole part. That clips on right there. Yep, that looks good. Okay, so now our gripper is attached. And we can move on to the next step. Again, the, the next step in our build instructions here is to connect these cables, but that's gonna be beyond the scope of uh, this video. So the last thing we're going to do is stick a gyro on the back. So I'll grab me a couple of pins here. And we'll go back to control system, grab our gyro sensor. Attach that to our robot here, just like that. And then that's it for our robot build. So you can see, uh, you know, with some with some practice and getting familiar with the software, um, it really can be quite easy to assemble uh, these these uh, these robots in CAD. Let's go back to our uh, slides here. Okay, so that concludes our demo. Um, you know, really the, the best way to use this software effectively and be quick is to have a, a lot of practice. You know, the, the more you um, model things in CAD, the more you get used to kind of what are the, the ways to do things quickly, and the more the more efficient you can really be. Uh, you know, with enough practice, you can really assemble stuff uh, uh, quite, quite quickly in CAD, which can be very, very useful for kind of developing prototypes and, and so on. Um, so that, that would be my first piece of advice for getting better is really just practice, practice, practice. Um, again, you know, we've uh, done our demo here in LDCAD, but the really great thing about the LDRAW format is that you don't just have to use LDCAD. If you, you know, play around with SnapCAD, if you prefer SnapCAD, use SnapCAD. You can play around with other, uh, 
other Eldra editors, you know, if you prefer one of those, use one of those. You can even go back and forth between multiple editors, right? So maybe I prefer LDCAD, but my teammate prefers SnapCAD. No, that's okay. I can do my modeling in LDCAD, send them the file, they can edit it in, in SnapCAD, and, and so on. So it can be a really, uh, really, really flexible system. Um, and I think, you know, the, the best way to practice, or one great way to practice, is to find build instructions like, you know, like, like these that we've been looking at, and model them, you know, in, in, in your CAD software. Um, obviously, when you're actually using the CAD package, you know, at, for designing your own robots, you're not going to be building stuff from instructions. But I think this can be a great way to kind of get familiar with the software. Find some, find some build instructions, model them, maybe build something yourself out of physical parts, model it, and really just, uh, just get as much practice and experience as you can. And the, the more you've done it, the, the easier it is. Okay, and lastly, um, some resources just to kind of uh, get more familiar with LDCAD in, in, in particular. Um, and these will be, there'll be links to these in the video descriptions. Um, this is the download page for LDCAD for VexIQ. There are instructions here for getting it uh, downloaded and, and installed. Uh, there are a couple different ways to do it. Um, this procedure works fine. This will give you an, an, uh, an install of LDCAD. Uh, but this slightly modified version is actually based on not quite the newest version of the main LDCAD build. So if you want to uh, have that newest version, and it does have a couple of nice features, uh, you don't need to use the newest version. Um, the, the version on, on this download page will work fine. But if you want to use the newest version, there is a, an article here that will describe um, kind of how to download the latest version for Lego and the Vex IQ parts package and uh, make them work together so that you get the newest version uh, of LDCAD together with uh, the Vex IQ, or the Vex IQ parts package. Um, also here is the LDCAD user guide. There's lots of great information about all the functionality LDCAD has. We have really just scratched the surface with this um, video. You can sort parts into different steps. You can do flexible parts. The, you can do animations of your parts. There's a whole scripting setup. So you really can do a huge amount with uh, LDCAD. It's a very full featured piece of software and the official documentation explains how to do all of that. And then lastly is just, uh, there's a lot of information on YouTube, a lot of um, videos about using LDCAD and how to do various things. Um, so that can be a great resource too, just to search for LDCAD or SnapCAD or the name of whatever other e editor you want to use um, on, on YouTube. There can be a lot of great information there. Okay, uh, this concludes our uh, video workshop. Uh, thanks everyone for watching, and goodbye.